Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. Today we're going to restore a FADA radio from 1937. In a previous video, we took a look at the chassis, did a little bit of troubleshooting, and got the radio going by just basically trimming out one component. In this video, we're going to completely restore this chassis. We're going to make it perform like it did back in 1937. In order to do that, we're going to take the radio into lab number two, and we're going to use the Supreme Vitalizer to do the alignment. So this should be a lot of fun. So let's get started. This is the FADA radio receiver from 1937 that we are going to restore today. Together, we're going to bring this radio receiver back to life, then we're going to make it perform the way it performed when it rolled off the factory production line way back in the 1930s, so this should be a lot of fun. For those of you that are just joining in now and that haven't seen the previous troubleshooting video, the chassis has already been out of the case and we did a little bit of troubleshooting on it, but no restoration has been done and there's been a lot of requests for a restoration. So, as to give all of you that are just joining in now a complete overview or a complete video surrounding this radio, I've put the chassis back in, I'll quickly explain the controls and some functions, and then we'll get right into that restoration. So this is the on off and volume control right here, you can hear the switch and the volume control. This is the tuning control. You can see the dial pointer move right here, it has two bands, it has the AM broadcast band, and the second band is kind of interesting. It goes from the top end of the AM broadcast band all the way through the 160 meter amateur radio band through 2 megahertz or 2 megacycles if you prefer, all the way through the 80 meter amateur radio band and it stops at 4 megacycles or 4 megahertz if you prefer. Now the nice thing about having this one band in here is there is still some AM action on those bands. So some radio amateurs still talk in AM modes in these bands here. So that is kind of a neat bonus because this is an AM radio receiver, right? This here just selects between the AM broadcast band and that second band on the bottom here. All in all, the radio's case and everything is in really nice condition. As you can see, the top of the grill cloth here has what looks to be like a little bit of fraying. Now, that really isn't worth tampering with because if I remove this, this is glued into the case and I risk really damaging the rest of this original grill cloth and it's in a really nice condition. So I'm prepared just to leave that little bit in there. I'm really not too worried about that, just to keep it as original as possible. So all in all, it's in fantastic, you know, physical condition. So now we need to make the internals work as good as it looks. Here's a quick look at the back side of the radio receiver with the chassis inside the Bakelite case. It's all complete, which is really nice. A lot of the time, throughout time, these shields go missing on the tubes, so a lot of people are fiddling with the tubes inside these older radio receivers. They take the shields off and they figure that the shields aren't needed when really they are. So very important to have these, and it's nice that they're here. And the caps are here too, so the caps hold the shields together. So you just pop that off, and if you look at the shield here, just comes apart in two pieces. So that's kind of nice to have that all there. Now getting the chassis out of this is really quite simple. All you have to do is remove the knobs from the front and they just pop right off. So you just pull forward like so, like so, and like so. And then all you do is just remove the four screws on the bottom of the radio receiver. So there's one in each foot and the whole chassis just slides right out. It's just that simple. You can see people have been in this radio receiver throughout time. It does have a modern line cord on it. So people have been fooling around with this and it looks like they've used a piece of the old line cord as an antenna connection in here. So it does have tampering. And again, in the troubleshooting video we saw underneath the chassis, but you're gonna see under the chassis here in just a moment. So I'll remove the chassis. We'll take a look at the underside and I'll talk about what needs to be done in the restoration. We'll bring this thing back to life again and make it perform the way it did way back in the late 30s. Getting the radio out of the case is really quite easy. They have got little screws right in the middle of the feet. So just a little twist and they come out just like that. Tell these have been out a time or two. The threads on those screws are not all that great. So I'll just remove this here. 
The nice thing is, is the bubble window on the tuning section here is recessed, so it doesn't, you know, it's not sticking out, it's not laying on the uh, on the mat here or anything like that. One thing to check before you ever put a radio on its face, because that little bubble window will get damaged, or you'll put a crease in it. You definitely don't want to do that, because they're pretty hard to find. You'd have to remake something, so this should just slide out like so. Put this down here. I'll just get the case out of the way and we'll take a look at the chassis. Looking at the top side of the chassis, the radio is in very nice condition. Everything is all there. Just a little bit of you know, surface dirt, things like that. Some of the wiring could get cleaned up. The speaker itself has no tears. It's in very nice condition and it moves. Now I often get the question, isn't there supposed to be a dust cap on this? Well, no, there's not. Way back when, they didn't put dust caps on speakers like this. And as you can see, this one moves just fine and there is no binding. So it worked then and it's still working now. A lot of the original components are still in here. Which is kind of nice. The more original that this thing is, the easier it is to actually work on. It's when techs get in here over time and start changing parts out and putting the wrong parts and pieces then not only are you changing components from when they fixed it, but you're also having to correct their problems. So it's nice to see that this is all looking pretty original. So I'll just get this thing upside down here and sturdied on the bench, and we'll take a look at the underside. Every one of these older pieces of equipment tell a story, whether it's an older radio, television, piece of test gear, just by looking at the components on the bottom side, I can tell a lot about this radio receiver. For example, this is a filter capacitor that has been replaced, and this is the oldest component that has been replaced in this radio receiver. Another filter capacitor has been replaced here, and this is much newer than this one. So chances are, right there we know that this has been visited twice. We can also tell by the way that this capacitor has been put in, and the way that this capacitor has been put in. The first tech took greater care, they shielded the, the positive side of the capacitor here, whereas this one here just floats in midair, and ties to a really sloppy point right here that's just been hung in midair. So two different techs, one that took some pride in his work, and another one here that really didn't care. This orange dip capacitor has also been replaced. No shielding on either of the leads, and it's in mid-air, nice long leads. Very good chance that this was put in when this capacitor was put in by the same person. If we look over here, we can see the line cord has been replaced, and most likely for good reason. Reason being is one side of the line cord in this radio from the factory attaches directly to the chassis. Way back in the day, line cords were not polarized. So you could take the line cord and you could plug it into the wall this way, or you could plug it into the wall this way, giving you a 50-50 chance of making the chassis of this radio receiver hot. Now, it wasn't uncommon to see nice big burn marks on the back side of the chassis, because antennas way back in the day, everybody was trying to ground the chassis and then hook the antenna lead up to the antenna that they have outside the house. Now, if you had plugged this in the wrong way by accident and you touched a ground lead to the chassis of the radio receiver, you got a really big flash, you blew the breaker or screw in fuse, most likely way back in the day. You had glass type screw in fuses in the breaker panels. And there was a really good chance that, you know, you gave yourself a good buzz. So, by putting a polarized line cord on this, like somebody has done, they've made an attempt to make this just a little bit safer. Now, when I say a little bit, I really do mean a little bit. Reason being is because what they did is they broke the neutral side of the of the line cord in the switch and the neutral side attaches to the chassis so when you shut the switch off the neutral side breaks and then what happens well the chassis floats hot again because you've broken the neutral side so for example if this thing was plugged in and you had a polarized line cord like this and it was wired correctly and you shut the radio off if you were to take the common lead of your oscilloscope probe and touch it to the chassis you would turn the radio on. If you were to remove this, you would shut the radio off. If, for some reason, you came between the chassis and the oscilloscope probe, you would receive a pretty nasty buzz. 
That's why, whenever radios like this are worked on, it's very important to have a thing called an isolation transformer, and that isolates the radio chassis from the line side. Now, isolation transformers, when working on anything like this, are a must. An isolation transformer on the bench is just a really good safety thing to have. So, if you're unfamiliar with working on radios like this, definitely don't attempt this until you learn more about it. And if you're following along, you're doing so at your own risk. Be very, very careful. I'll get more into the safety aspect of things in other videos here. I've talked a lot about this particular thing. This radio here is a really good example of that because in a lot of radios, the chassis of the radio is capacitively coupled to either the neutral or the hot side depending on how it's been wired. This one has a direct connection to the line cord. So 1937, right? This is before things kind of changed and got a tad safer. So this one here is uh, you know, definitely a radio that you would need to have some form of experience to work on, or you could really damage your test equipment or yourself. Again, isolation transformers, absolute must with something like this. So in order to make this thing perform again, I need to go through and I need to replace all these capacitors, because all these capacitors are you know most likely bad by now this one here is a more modern style capacitor and these ones last a very very long time so this one could most likely be left in here but i'm going to replace all of them at this point anyways so this has to go this has to go this one 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 and then there's another one on the upper side that needs to go as well possibly two so lots of parts need to be replaced to make this dependable and quite a bit safer as well. So a lot of the times when these capacitors fail, they actually, they kind of pop like a firecracker. They blow the end out of them and they spray wax all over the place and they make quite a, a loud noise. And then these ones here are no exception as well. So all of that stuff has to go. These here resistors are known as dog bone style resistors, and you can read them by remembering bed, like the bed you sleep in, body and dot. So the body on this resistor is purple, which is seven. The end is green, which is five. And then the multiplier is red, which is the number two. So whenever you see the multiplier, you replace that number with zeros. So since that's the number two, put two zeros there. So 7500, 0, 7500 ohms. So you can see the multiplier here is brown, so that's the number 1. What do we do with that? We replace that with 1, 0. So again, body and dot. Body is red, number 2. End is yellow, number 4. And then the dot is the number 1, which would be 1, 0, 240 ohms. They've taken the time to put the tolerance on these resistors as well. You can see silver here, so it's 10% tolerances. Some, or even, you know, marked with a gold dot, which is really not all that common to see. So this is, uh, you know, most likely going to be a pretty accurate resistor for back when. It looks like all the resistors are all original. I don't see any replaced resistors. I just see replaced capacitors in here. So, the resistors here will end up testing, making sure that they're all okay. If the resistors are okay, I can leave the dog bone ones in there. And if they're all way out, then of course I'm going to replace all of the dog bone resistors as well. So hopefully they're okay, and that'll lessen the rebuild time here quite a bit. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to get started on replacing these capacitors here. And just before I do, actually, you know what we'll do? So we'll take this into lab number two and we'll test some of these resistors with a piece of test equipment that was made about the same time that this radio was made. We're going to attach this thing to the Supreme Vitalizer. Is there any doubt that this restoration is going to be awesome? Before we test some of the components in this radio receiver with the Supreme Vitalizer, I'm very interested to see if the previous repairman or technician wired this cord correctly as to make the radio receiver a little bit safer. Don't try this at home. Let me do the dangerous stuff. This is plugged directly into the wall right now, so if I turn the radio receiver on, you'll see it come on. This is my oscilloscope probe that's attached to my oscilloscope, and the neutral lead here is attached to the safety ground. Okay, so with this radio receiver in the off position right now, the switch is off, it should be breaking the neutral connection. If it breaks the neutral connection, the chassis of this radio should be floating hot right now. If the chassis of the radio is floating hot, technically, if I put this light bulb in series 
with the neutral connection on my oscilloscope probe, it should turn the radio on and light this light bulb up because the bulb will be in series with the neutral. So let's see what happens. And this will give you a good idea of why an isolation transformer is so needed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the center connection of the light bulb and I'm going to attach it to the chassis. And then I'm going to touch the neutral or common connection of my oscilloscope probe to the threaded base. I'm not coming in contact with anything metal here. Everything's all insulated. So, here we go. There it is. So you can see the dangers of this. It's passing quite a bit of current. It's able to light up a 60 watt light bulb. So if I was to come between the chassis and that point right there, I would receive a very bad shock. So let's use the meter as an example here. So I'll put this right here and I'll move the focus onto the meter screen. So now, instead of using a light bulb, I'll put the meter in series here. Turn this on. Attach the common from the meter to the chassis, and I'll take the red lead of my meter and attach it to the common of my oscilloscope here, and let's see what the meter says. Here we go. The meter doesn't lie. Ouch. There we go. Full line voltage right there. And if I turn the radio on, what it should do is connect the common, or the neutral line, up to the radio here, and this should drop way down, probably below a volt. And there it is, about 0.7 of a volt, because now it's bridging out the other neutral or common connection. If I shut this off, what will happen again? The chassis will float hot, and... Ouch! Goes right up to full line voltage. So there you have it. That's an example of why an isolation transformer is so needed in a chassis like this. Now, if we were to look at this a different way, if I didn't have a polarized plug, I'm just going to unplug this. So if I didn't have a polarized plug on this thing, and I turned the radio on, and I had the plug plugged in the opposite way, that means that the hot side would be switched to the chassis. Move the focus back to the chassis here. If the hot side is switched to the chassis, if I turn the radio on, that would mean that the hot connection is directly to this. If I was to attach the light bulb to the chassis, it would light up fully. And, of course, you know, between the chassis and neutral would be, you know, the line would be the entire line. You could power up a power tool between it, right? It would you know, be full current. So if I was to take my oscilloscope probe and I was to attach it to the chassis in a case like that, and this is where many techs go wrong. The radio is switched on, no isolation transformer, and it's plugged in just that right way. You touch this and poof, a huge spark. It blows the lead off of your probe, usually wrecks the probe, and sometimes even damages your oscilloscope. So again, isolation transformers, absolute must with any series-connected transformerless set. So let's take this thing over to the beetleizer and see how well these uh, resistors have held up over time. Here we are in the old time lab. The radio is at the far end of the bench, right over there, right in front of the beetleizer. So grab your favorite beverage, take a seat, and let's get testing. I'm ready to start using the beetleizer to start testing some of the resistors on the underside of the chassis and this older radio receiver, but the first thing I need to do is align the beetleizer to start reading the ohm scale. So the beetleizer has warmed up for a while, that's very important. So the first thing I need to do is adjust the needle here till it's just beyond that end line. I find that to be the highest accuracy. So I need to move this, and you can see the needle moving on the scale. Need to move this just until that's beyond the end line. So what I'll do is I'll zoom on into that a little bit here, and then you can see what I'm doing. So this would be the end line here, and just beyond that line, so just this one here would be the, the next line that I would use for alignment on this. So between this line and this line, right about in the center, which is about right there is where I find this to be the highest accuracy. So I always align that to there, and that applies to all the scales on here. So now what I need to do is I need to adjust 
the zero volts now, so I need to short the test leads here, like so. And you'll see that this goes down to the bottom. Now if I move this, I can adjust the zero. So that's the next thing I need to do. So I'll zoom back on into this, and I will adjust this. Now I'm looking at this straight on, and the camera's on a bit of an angle, so that's right on top of the zero line. So it might look like it's a little bit off to you, but it's right on top of the line right there. Now, in order to test the resistor that I'm going to test first, this isn't an auto-ranging meter, so what I need to do is select the correct scale. I'm going to be testing a 7.5k ohm resistor first, so I need to select the R times 10m scale, which is that one right there. So, I'll show you on the underside of the chassis the resistor that I'm going to be checking, and that's this resistor right here. This is a 7.5k ohm resistor, and the next one I'm going to check is this 240 ohm resistor right here. Now, a lot of people think that they need to disconnect one end of the resistor in circuit in order to get a correct reading. Well, most of the time in vacuum tube equipment, you don't need to do that because what happens is one end of the resistor ends up at a very high impedance point in the circuit, so it's really not needed. Much different than working on solid state equipment. So if you're working on solid state equipment, usually there's going to be something in the circuit that's going to fool your meter. A little bit harder to test components in circuit. And this applies to, you know, vacuum tube radios, amplifiers, test equipment, and all that stuff. Most of the time, you can get a very accurate reading by testing the resistor in circuit without having to remove a lead or anything like that. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the future here when we start servicing some audio amplifiers. So what I'll do is I'll just focus back up on the meter here and we'll test that 7.5k ohm resistor. Get that a little bit more centered. Okay, here we go. And it's just a little bit over 6k ohms. Now I find that a lot of the dog bone resistors in this radio receiver have drifted down in value, not up, which is kind of interesting. So just a little bit over 6k ohms, which is fine. I'm gonna leave that in circuit. They drift down just a little bit, that's okay. When they start going really high, then there's a problem. So, just to give you a double check here, what I'll do is I'll grab this newer meter, the ouch meter, and I'll just clip this into circuit here. I'll clip it right across the resistor in circuit, and you can see that it reads 6.3k ohms. So, this is very accurate. No problems with this meter whatsoever. Done extensive testing with that with the scales on the Vitalizer just to make sure that everything is very accurate and I'm actually really quite surprised how accurate this is. So I want to test the 240 ohm resistor next so I need to put this on the R times 100 scale. The nice thing about this is when you select the buttons you really don't have to readjust the zero ohms or zero volts everything stays right where it is it's just fine. So I'll zoom back into the meter here and let the focus catch up. And here we go, I'll go right across this 240 ohm resistor. And as you can see, a little bit over 200 ohms. So the next line up is 225. So I'd say about maybe 215, something like that. 210, 215 ohms, absolutely fine. Now being incredibly accurate and knowing this out to you know 214.8 is not needed in equipment like this. So that's absolutely fine. No problems, that resistor's good. Let's see what else can we check. There's a 30k ohm resistor here, so I'll adjust the scale again to the R times 10M. And I will test this 30k resistor here. Look at that, right on 30k, no problems. And there is a 50k resistor here. Let's test the 50k resistor. And working around a corner here, I got the probe leads on this. And that's about 45k. No problems there. Maybe a little over 45k, no problems. So all in all, all the resistors in this radio receiver here, if I go through all of them, just focus down here on the chassis. So most of the resistors in here are very, very close to their spec. And you know, when they go down a little bit, I'm not too concerned about it. It's when they really start to climb high. It's a, it's an issue. 
and they all test very, very good. So I've gone through and I've tested every single resistor before this just to get a good idea whether I'm going to have to change any of these things out. And they all look like they can stay. So really what's going to have to happen here is all the capacitors are going to have to go and the resistors can stay in circuit, which is kind of nice. That lowers a bit of the restoration time. And then what I'll do is I'll clean the chassis up and get the thing all ready for an alignment, put the align cord in and everything. We'll get that all underway. When I have that all done, I'll be back. We'll take a look at what's been done and we'll get into the alignment using the Vitalizer. The radio cleaned up really nice. As you can see, the chassis came out spotless. So I used a product called Vim. I'm not endorsed by them or anything, but uh, it's just a product that works very well. I used a product called Vim and cleaned the chassis off with that. And then after I was done, I took some WD-40 and wiped down the entire chassis. And as you can see, it came out spotless. I removed the speaker and all the tubes and everything to do this as well. I left the IF transformers on and you know the tuning assembly and everything like that and just Took a lot of time and cleaned everything between everything used lots of q-tips things like that and uh, just cleaned the upper side of the chassis so it turned out very very nice so obviously underneath all that dirt you know this thing was kept in a nice warm atmosphere it was never exposed to the elements or anything like that because there's just there's no chassis rust or anything like that now the tube shields they really can't do anything about there's some form of plating on them that's come off so i'll just leave the tube shields the way they are and plus they get warm too because there's a you know a tube covered in there and it gets pretty hot so I'll leave these the way they are and it's kind of nice to leave a little bit of the I guess you could call it patina on the chassis because it is from 1937 and it should reflect that I don't want the thing to glow and shine like it was you know rolled off the the factory floor put in a box and never used right so it's nice to have that that look like it's been taken care of very well but it does show its age so what I'm going to do is flip the chassis over and we'll take a look at the underside and I'll explain what I've done. All the capacitors on the bottom side of the chassis have been replaced aside from some of the mica capacitors and the variables. They are absolutely fine to leave in there. So if you're ever working on a radio receiver like this and you come across these capacitors right here, if they are a mica capacitor and they're in the oscillator section, oscillator mixer section, you want to do your best to try and leave those behind because changing out many of these capacitors will affect the dial tracking. So something to always remember, these capacitors are usually pretty resilient. If it is gone bad, of course, you're going to need to replace it. You want to get as close to the factory value as possible. As I've mentioned in many of my other videos, a lot of these capacitors are hand-picked. Even though they have a color code on them, they are hand-picked to make the oscillator track that dial as you know, accurately as possible. So the ones that are actually in the oscillator circuit are very, very important. This goes for any shortwave receiver or you know, any type of receiver of this age. So always keep that in mind. Also, replacing these with a, an NP0 type capacitor is okay as well if it has to be replaced. These are the new electrolytic capacitors right here. I installed another standoff as a tie point. I did my best to clean up the bottom portion of the chassis as to leave things that are a possible service item in the future very easy to get at. For example, if I ever needed to remove the speaker to maybe get to the top side of the chassis for something or to you know service it, as you can see now, the screws are exposed where they weren't exposed at all before. So the capacitors have a root right through the center of them. You know, and this one's off to the side. So this is the mount for the speaker here. And then there's one more mount right here, which mounts the front of the speaker to the front side of the radio right here. These capacitors are on the cathodes. This one's on the cathode of the output tube. And this one here is on the cathode of the audio amplifier and detector tube right here. You can see I added a newer imitation style cloth cord to really add to the original look of this. So this is a modern updated cord, very safe cord that is polarized. So it has that indexed plug on it. The neutral now ties directly to the chassis. You can see there's no brakes. The hot side goes over to the tube socket using this one here as a tie point. There's a strain relief right here. You can see if I move the, the cord around, it moves a little bit. Well, I don't want that to tug on this fuse. So this is a one and a half amp fuse that's in line with the rest of the radio. I call this an absolute value fuse. This isn't supposed to go away unless something really goes wrong with the radio. So it's 
important to put a fuse in the radio, especially when it's rewired and the switch itself has the hot running through it now. So this has been rewired and the hot now goes through the back side of the switch and comes over to the radio. So the fuse is really the very first thing in line on the hot side of the cord. And reason being is if the switch itself was to ever short or anything goes wrong beyond this point here, you know, the fuse will just go away. So this is a nice miniature one and a half amp, 125 volt fuse that's in here. So the strain relief is, uh, is really needed, especially on these older tube sockets, because the actual pin in that tube is not populated. So moving this around like this does flex the pin around. You can see it, it's actually moving the strain relief here. But it leaves the fuse alone, so the fuse isn't tugged on. I don't want that happening because, you know, it's common to move the line cord, right? So the restraint in here is two tie straps pulled very tight on the cord, and it's, that's enough to hold the cord in itself with this washer. But on top of that, I've super glued the entire end of this onto the line, so this is extremely solid. This would never pull out. And again, the neutral line just goes right over to the chassis, so this is a solid neutral. The plug itself is indexed. So you can see the indexed plug right here. Very nice imitation cloth line cord really adds to the originality of the set yet keeps it as safe as possible the original electrolytic capacitor all the leads have been trimmed off and it's just a little patch of tar really on the bottom there so that's you know nice and clean and flush with the chassis so just lots of cleaning and care to attention have gone in here uh, xy rated capacitors here x1 y2 rated capacitor here which runs from the the hot side to the chassis itself very important to use these capacitors whenever something goes across the line and i've also put one of these in the antenna circuit as well so this red wire that you see here it just runs off the back connects to the antenna input it's really just had a wire and it was intended to just attach to a long wire outside so that's still hooked up and again another one of these safety capacitors is on the top which connects to the antenna these capacitors fail in a safe mode if something ever goes wrong so since this is really across the line this is after the fuse as well so if this ever did fail the wrong way it would just take that little one and a half amp fuse out but this here is across the line here so important to have that and of course there's the antenna which couples to this wire, which could be coupled to something you know, outside the chassis here, it's supposed to be attached to an antenna. It will have to be attached to an antenna if we want to hear anything on this thing, that's for sure. So mind you, you know, I imagine this is probably pretty sensitive. This is a very well-designed receiver right from the factory. So I imagine that this is going to you know, work very well. There's a few things that are kind of interesting about this design. There's really only one adjustment to adjust the entire oscillator. So you would adjust that for the broadcast band and then you know you would just hope that the shortwave band comes in close that's just the way that this was made right they don't have two adjustments for each band to make the oscillator track correctly so hopefully you know the shortwave band's going to come in close and we can dial on the broadcast band with this let's see what else can i tell you about this all the resistors are fine they tested out really good again you know a lot of time just cleaning things up as you can see it cleaned up really quite nice Everything uh, went together really clean. Lots and lots of time, you know, through the magic of the camera, you know, it's just one shot to the next. But this here is actually days and days of work, just methodically thinking where things should go. When I'm decoupling things inside here, I'm making sure that the leads are, you know, decoupled close to the tube socket just to try and get the performance as good as possible out of this receiver. So uh, I talk a lot about this, you know, the techniques and stuff to make these older receivers perform well. Lots of time and, you know, taking the time to search the outside foil layer of the capacitor so the capacitor is shielded up to the tube socket as close as possible. So the outside foil layer on all my capacitors has a little dot. You can actually just see the little dot right here. And there's a little dot here. And the lead is very close to the tube socket here. Things like that. Just uh, lots and lots of care and attention went into trying to make this as, as good as possible so we can really get a good idea of how well this radio can perform. So hopefully it does perform as good as the when it rolled off the factory floor or possibly even better now that leads have shortened and, you know, the decoupling and all that kind of stuff is so close. You know, there's not long runs of wire before capa this capacitor here had its uh, ground side or common side running all the way over to this point right here. It's a really thick portion of the chassis. So I wanted to just to reserve this for the neutral line. So the neutral line just runs over here and I want to keep all the components away from these cords here. 
You can see that this line is running underneath this resistor, but it doesn't touch the resistor. This resistor is quite a ways up from it. You can't really tell because of the view of the camera. You know, I want to keep components away from this area. So if the line cord does move, you know, it's not going to really touch anything and it stays away from it. The added piece of uh, high heat shielded tubing runs over here into this area just to keep things protected in this in this other area in case something was to ever flex this down and this would touch the you know the the tube socket pins I wouldn't want anything to melt through the insulation this is clear of everything over here and as you can see it's it's a ways away from the wall and you know it's well actually quite a ways away from the wall but if that was to ever push in and and something was to cut into the wire, it wouldn't matter because this is neutral anyways. This is neutral and this is neutral, but it is, you know, a ways away. I'm, nothing is ever going to touch. Getting this cord through this original rubber grommet. The rubber grommet is incredibly nice on this. It's soft. I uh, The rubber on that has just lasted. I don't even know. Maybe this is some sort of interesting material because usually rubber goes hard, but this is just, it's soft. It's like the day it was made. So pushing this cord through that was a lot of grief, getting this through that grommet. So it is tight. It's really, really tight. It doesn't even want to rotate in there, yet it can, you know, so it's uh, a nice strain relief there. So that is the underside of the chassis. I don't know what else I can tell you about this. So now what we need to do is we need to plug this thing into my isolation transformer and turn the thing on and see if it comes to life. If it comes to life, it will get the Supreme Vitalizer treatment. We'll do the alignment and take a listen to it. All right, let's see if the radio comes to life. You'll notice that the audio output tube is different. I wanted to start this entire restoration off with the tubes that this came with. Now, before this video was even started and before this restoration was even started, I did an extended troubleshooting procedure on Patreon. And I used the radio itself to test the tubes, and I wanted to show people how to do that. There was a couple of bizarre problems in this radio receiver, and I wanted to show how to find those really bizarre problems. One of them was really unique in this section right over here. So we found that this tube here had internal leakage, and it was humming, and we used the radio itself to determine that. So I swapped the tube out and that got rid of a lot of the hum back then. Now, of course, it had those older filter capacitors in there, so there was still a little bit of hum present. But now with all of this new capacitors and everything in here, it should be very, very quiet. So that's the reason that you see this new tube here. If you're interested in those very in-depth troubleshooting procedures and locating these really bizarre problems, definitely check that out on Patreon. It was a very, very good video. Lots of time put into that and lots of signal tracing and things like that here. Okay, so this is my antenna connection. I just have it sitting here. I don't have anything hooked up. So what I want to do is I want to just turn the radio on first. So I'll make sure that it is on. Okay, it's on. The volume's down. I have this plugged into my Variac and isolation transformer here. So the supply runs into the isolation transformer. Out of the isolation transformer comes to the Variac, and then the Variac goes out to this. So I'm going to bring the radio up really slowly, monitoring the dial light here, and we'll see what happens. Okay, so this here is on already. You can see that. It's an on-off switch right here. So the only thing I have to do is turn this on, and the Variac is down. Very important to always check your Variac to make sure it's down at zero when you start. As you can see, this will actually step voltage up. So this will bring it up to 140 volts, and if it's at the wrong end, that can be kind of hard on things. So kind of nice if you have a you know reduced line, you can overcompensate with this. So here we go. Zero volts. So what I'll do is I'll bring it up to about... 50 volts to start. We can just see the dial light coming on in there. Let that warm up for just a moment. Now everything is fused. I have very, you know, a very low current fuse in here, an amp and a half. So if anything does go wrong, that little fuse will just go away. But a lot of care and attention was put into this, so I imagine it will probably be just fine. Okay, bring it up to about 90 volts or so. Just keeping an eye on that rectifier tube there. So you can start to glow a little bit. Lots of light shining on it here, so it's kind of hard to see the filaments. At least in the camera, anyways. Tip this forward just a bit. See the filaments starting to light up there just a little bit. Okay, I'm bring this up to 120. Everything looks like everything is happening just fine here. 
Boy, that radio sits quiet. You see, this is the good design. You know, they've got a filter reactor in here, and that's the reason that this sits so quiet. You know, in the newer, modern, all-American fives, they don't do that, because that was a very costly piece to put in there. But boy, this radio, it's just quiet. See if I've got something here that um, could be magnetic. Let's see if the speaker is on. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Definitely on. Okay, so I'll turn the volume down here. I don't know what band I'm on or anything like that. So what I'll do is I'll just attach an antenna. And I'll see what happens here. Give it some volume. Whoa, that's just turning the volume a little bit. It would definitely be a short wave band, so try this out. Well, I'd say that's definitely working. So now we can proceed on to the IF alignment. So what I'm going to do is warm up the vitalizer and my signal generator, and we'll perform an IF alignment. Make this thing as sensitive as possible. We'll check the oscillator to make sure it's tracking correctly. And after that, we're pretty much ready to try the thing out and listen around the band, see how sensitive the thing really is. Before I go about retuning the IF section in this radio receiver, I can do a little bit of detective work first using the Vitalizer. The Vitalizer will tell me exactly where the last repairman or technician left the tuning of the two IF transformers. So I can see if it's on frequency or off frequency just by tuning the radio to a strong signal. And I'll show you how that's done here. So what I've done is I have a test lead that's going to go to the Vitalizer clipped onto the insulation of the wire that's running to the diode plates. The Vitalizer is so sensitive that it will pick the signal right off the insulation of the wire. So it's just capacitively coupling to the alligator clip. Now all I need to do is tune this to a strong radio signal and then once that's done I'm going to ground out the control grid of the audio output tube. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ground out this portion right here just so the radio sits absolutely silent. Okay, Because on a really really strong radio signal just a little bit of audio comes through the speaker, a very very slight amount so I just want it to sit nice and quiet so it's not distracting. So I'll turn the volume up and I'll find a strong radio signal. Listen to me, your New Year's that is uh, really loud. Directly contradict the law. Wow. This is exactly why we need. And that is very strong. Well, David will be back with some additional teaching. For so right there is a nice strong radio signal. There's just a touch of audio there, so I'll ground out the control grid right here. Now the radio will sit nice and silent. I'll plug this into the Vitalizer, into the IF port, and I'm going to tune the wave meter until I get maximum signal on the scope or on this meter here. I can use either one, and at maximum signal, wherever this is sitting, is the IF frequency. Just that easy. So I'll just rotate this up. I'm at 375 right now. What I'll do is I'll zoom on into this, actually, and that'll be a little bit easier to see, so pardon the movement of the camera here. And we'll zoom right on to that. And try and get that as close as I can. A little bit of a glare from the light bulb behind that there, but I think that's still viewable. So I'm at 375 right now. I'm just going to move the focus up to the top here so I don't defocus it with my hand and I'll keep going. So we can keep an eye on the scope and on the meter. And as you can see, we're getting closer. And we just passed it, so I'll back this up. Right to about there is where the IF frequency is. That's the maximum signal. So you can see we're at 425 here, 430, 435, at about 437 or 438 kilohertz. Well, that's way off frequency. Whoever tuned this the last time 
you know, didn't tune it very well. Now you're probably thinking, well, you changed a lot of components on the underside of the chassis. Maybe that shifted the frequency. Nope. I haven't retuned the transformers at all. So it should affect the IF frequency very little. And if you watch the previous troubleshooting video on this chassis right here, this frequency of the IF section is displayed on the oscilloscope and it's spot on to what the vitalizer says. So the IF frequency is supposed to be at 456, which is way up here. So the IF is way, way, way off. So what we need to do now is retune the IF section to 456 and that way we'll have the maximum sensitivity and of course the dial will line up just a little bit better as well. I'm about to perform the alignment on this radio receiver here so the first thing I need to do is adjust the IF transformers. In order to do that I need to set up my signal generator and the vitalizer. So the first thing I'm going to do is set the signal generator to 456 kilohertz. So right now it's at 1.696 megahertz and that's nowhere near where we need to be so I'll move the camera over here and we'll zoom on into that just a little bit better. So I need to adjust this down to band B. and move that to 456. So now I'm at 456 kilohertz. Nice thing about this series E200C, I did a restoration on this and added a bunch of things to it as well. The thing is rock stable. Once it's warm, it does not move. That counter sat at 1696 forever. So it's a very, very stable, very nice oscillator, nice little signal generator to use. So right now the modulation is on, so there will be a 400 cycle tone on that frequency and it's about 50% modulated, so that's absolutely fine. So now what I need to do is I need to calibrate the vitalizer. I want to make sure it's exactly at 456. So what I can do is I can take the output right here and feed it directly into the vitalizer and then tune the wave meter to exactly 456. And then I will use the vitalizer as an indication tool for the IF and also use the audio in the radio receiver as well. So what I'll do is I'll move this over to the vitalizer. And I'll zoom on into that. So I'll attach the coax to the same area I attached the receiver earlier. So it's to the IF input. I'll put this on here like so. And now all I need to do is tune this for a peak. So we're going to be roughly around 456. So that should be just after that line right there. 450, 55, and 56. So if you go past, you have to go back. And if you pass it again, you've got to go back. Again, you're looking for maximum amplitude. And now all of you modern scope people can see why a graticule for something like this is not needed, especially on an old tool like this. I can adjust the sink on this side to get a little bit clearer pattern on the scope. And of course that'll move in and out a little bit as well, so that's fine. I just use this amplitude as an indication, or the meter again is absolutely fine to use that with either or is absolutely fine. And as you can see, looking right at the meter, we're right at 456. I'll just zoom on in a little more. It's just over the 455 line. So it's amazing how accurate the engineers at Supreme got this thing from way back when this thing was built. It's, um, it's actually quite amazing. Very accurate device. So, now that that's all done, I can disconnect the coax here, so I'll just disconnect this. That's disconnected. And I'll just go back over here to the signal generator. Get rid of this. And I'll hook up my test lead. I'll just get this piece of coax out of here because it's in the way. Put this on here like so. 
can leave the amplitude. This is at the, the low RF out. It has a low and a high RF out, so the amplitude at this output is much lower. So now what I want to do is I want to couple this into the top of the tuning capacitor here. So I'll move this back over to the radio. Right down here. Pardon the movement of the camera here. Lots of movement to get everything in the shot. So I want to couple it right into the grid cap right here. So what I can do is I can take this cap. Now this cap will very, very lightly couple the signal into the grid cap here very lightly. It's about 10 or 20 picofarad is absolutely fine. Anything in there. Again, the whole trick to aligning a radio receiver like this or any type of test equipment is to keep the piece of test equipment invisible to the device under test. And this is why I so lightly couple this in here. So what I'm going to do now is I will clip the common lead of my signal generator onto the chassis here, and I'm gonna feed the signal directly into the grid cap of the converter tube right here. So the signal will go directly in there. Now I'm gonna turn the volume up on the radio receiver I'm going to plug this back into the vitalizer again. So this is tied into exactly the same spot as we had before to the diode plate. So I'll put this in here. Just stick that on there like so. And so what I'm going to do is start tuning these adjustments right here. Now, another thing that's worth mentioning is many of the radios have the adjustments in the top of the IF transformers like this and they're hot. They have B plus on them. So it's very dangerous to use a metal tool in something like that. So I always measure the capacitors and these ones here are cold. There's no B plus on them at all. So when they are cold and in or a radio of this vintage, it's always nice to actually use a metal insulated screwdriver. So I'm insulated from the screwdriver, but it's actually metal that goes down into these adjustments. Now it won't detune these IF transformers. It's not like they're, you know, powdered iron cores or anything like that. But it is very important to have a very rigid type screwdriver because if you stick a plastic screwdriver in here or any type of a tuning tool, you'll strip it in these. They're just so tight. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use this screwdriver right here to adjust it. Again, I've already tested this. In many cases, if these are hot and then you short this out like this, you get a spark and it can damage the IF transformer and things like that. So something that should always be tested. And it's a very simple test. You just use your DMM on DC volts. And then without touching the side and the screw at the same time, you just use your probe and touch the screw and measure the volts and make sure that there's nothing on them. And that's, it's just that simple. So something to always keep in mind. Sometimes in some radio receivers, these adjustments are hot. In this one, it's not. So what I wanna do now is I wanna first start tuning the IF transformers. I'm not even so concerned about using the Vitalizer. I just want some form of noise to come out of this thing because the IF is so far off. So I'll just start tuning the IF transformers and we'll see what happens. So this is the first one I'm tuning right here. That went into an oscillation. Oh, there it is. Very, very light tone in there. Okay, so I'll go over to the next one here. And I should, it should get louder. And now to the next one. I'm going to have to turn the volume down. And to this one here. Look at how far off that was. Wow. So you can see how rigid these are. It's very easy for the screwdriver to slip out of that. This one is really tight. So now I'm going to go back and re-peak all of these. I'll turn down the, uh, the gain here. On the signal generator. So I just turned down the gain. Show you that here. So 
So I just turned this here down to 50%. And now what we'll do is we'll take a look at the Vitalizer and we'll use the Vitalizer to peak this up. Pardon the camera movements again here. We'll zoom on into that. So again, one more time, actually, what I'll do is I'll show you here. I'm just going to peak these up. We'll go from this one to this one. So one, two, three, four is how I'm going to do that. So I'll mention that as I'm twisting them. This is hard to get the camera on all of this at the same time. Okay. So now I'll use the Vitalizer. I'm probably pretty close at this point. I can give the Vitalizer some gain. So it's very sensitive. Again, this is just sniffing this off the, the shield of the wire. It's not even attached. It's just capacitively coupled. So I'll go back over here and adjust the first one. See how touchy it is? Then I'll go to two. It's about the max there. And I'll go over to three. And I'll go over here to four. So now the order is not all that incredibly important. We're just looking for maximum gain at this point. And I think we're already there. I'm just going to retune one here again. One more time. I'll go through this. Very touchy. Two. Three. And that is about it. And that's tuned now to 456 kilohertz. And that concludes the IF alignment. The next thing on the list to do is to adjust the dial tracking. First of all, we want to verify, make sure that when this pointer is, say, at 1,000 kilocycles, the receiver is receiving at 1,000 kilocycles. If the dial tracking is off, say we're receiving 1,000 a.m., but the dial might actually be pointing to 900 or, you know, maybe 1,100 a.m. or something like that. So it's very important to get that accurate. So the first thing I need to do is set up the signal generator. So we'll go back over to the signal generator over here. And I'll just shut this off so that we can see the counter nice. So now what I need to do is... There's 1000 AM or 1 megahertz. So... What we'll do is we'll go back to the radio receiver here. Like so. That's the actual factory lighting. It's not very bright, so that's why I'm lighting it up with external lighting here. So now what I want to do is turn the volume up. I have the signal generator coupled into the antenna input here, so directly into the antenna input. And I'll just tune up to 1 megahertz, and I should hear that tone on right when it's on the 100 mark right there, if the dial accuracy is correct. Let's see how close it is. So I'll just zoom on in. Okay, here we go. It's very close. Could be a lot worse. So, 
right about there would be correct. So in order to adjust that, I need to adjust this little trimmer capacitor right here. And that should put me on frequency. And that's the only adjustment. That's the only adjustment for the oscillator. So you adjust this and you just hope that the shortwave bands are correct. So what I'll do is just put the radio back up like this. And same thing as before. I'll just move this out a bit so you can see. Again, just a standard screwdriver is fine for this. So I'll just steady this here. And give it some volume. See if we can... So I'm looking for the deepest tone and the strongest signal. Now I can still use the Vitalizer to verify that. Or what I can do, even easier, is just turn down the signal generator. So I'm going to do that right now. Let's move over here. So I barely have an audible signal, or audible signal. You can hear there's a lot of static in there. And now we'll just move us again. And right there it is. And that can just be done by ear. Just looking for the deepest tone so that it's on frequency. And again, we're dealing with an analog dial, so I know we're... You move it like that and it's off, so you can tell we're very close. So I'll zoom on in again. Okay. And that's about as accurate as it's going to get. So I can try, say, 800. We'll see how well it tracks down to 800. Okay, so that's 800. So the signal generator is moved to 800. I'll show you that. I just adjusted that right now. See that there? 800. Okay. And we know where 800 is. Right there, let's see. Spot on. Again, camera's on a bit of an angle here. Just a little bit of an angle, so it's right on to my eye. Okay, so now, on to the short wave band. Let's see uh, how well that's going to receive or track. And we can also set up the, the antenna for that as well. That little adjustment on the side, we'll do that next. That little adjustment right there. I have my signal generator set to 3 megacycles, or 3 megahertz if you prefer. The short wave position has been selected on this radio receiver, so now I'm on the bottom portion of the dial here. I just randomly chose 3 megacycles. So let's see how well the dial tracks on the bottom portion here. So I'll move the needle over to 3 megacycles, and if the dial is tracking correctly, we should hear it. Not bad for a radio from 1937 with one adjustment on the top. So you can really tell these engineers knew what they were doing, especially with these old air core coils. Just incredible. So now what I want to do is I want to set up the sensitivity at the upper portion here. So I'm just going to roll this right to the top. And I'm going to tune my signal generator up to around 4 megacycles, something like that. Just wherever it is right at the top here is kind of off the scale. So I'll just do that now. And here we go. And yeah, there it is. So the signal's in there just a little bit. So I'm going to use the Vitalizer to adjust the sensitivity. So what I'm going to do is... 
adjust that adjustment right there. So it looks like it's wound pretty tight. And usually these receivers are the least sensitive at the upper frequencies. And this portion of the band here is a band that I really like to listen to. So what I'm going to do is adjust it for maximum sensitivity right at the top here. So I'm going to move this around like so. And I'll move the camera over to the utilizer. Like so. Get rid of the light. So it darkens things up just a little bit. The a bit dusty. Okay, so now I'm going to peak that up. So I'll just do that right now. I'll unwind that screw on the trimmer capacitor and let's see what happens. Screwdriver in there. Here we go. Wow. And there it is. Maximum sensitivity. So now what I can do is I can attach an antenna to this thing and we'll see how sensitive it is. Just give it a pre-check with an antenna. So I'll do that right now. Disconnect the signal generator and attach this to just an antenna right here. And we'll get that out of the way. Wow, it looks like it's really receiving. Wow. Some amateur radio operation right there in the 80 meter band, 75 meter band. Wow, lots and lots. I'm going to turn down the vitalizer here a bit. And I'm coming now towards the top end of the broadcast band on that short wave scale. So there it is. Wow, the short wave band is very sensitive. So this receiver is working very well. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to clean up that Bakelite cabinet just a little bit. I'll spend some time with it later. I'm pretty excited. I want to get this thing in there and so that we can take a listen to it. So I'll do that. I'll pop the radio back into the cabinet and set everything up and we'll cruise around the bands and take a listen, see how sensitive this thing really is. Let's take a listen to this newly restored FADA radio receiver and see how well it receives on the broadcast band. So that's the upper portion of the dial right here. So I'll give it some volume and let's take a listen. <laughs> On what is receiving incredibly sounds very, very nice. So, next, we'll take a listen to this short wave band right here. I've now selected the short wave portion of the radio receiver. So the broadcast band runs through this area right down in here, and then it starts to enter the 160 meter amateur band and then goes up through the 80 and 75 meter amateur radio bands over here. So I'm not sure how active those bands are right now, but we'll take a listen anyways and see what happens. So we should hear radio signals in this area right here, just standard broadcast.
So that's the time signal right there at 2.5 megahertz. So it's receiving well. Some computer generated noises. More computer generated noises. And the rest of the amateur band is quiet right now. It's really early in the morning and I kind of expected that. Some Morse code in there. Time signal again. Nice and strong. Now keep in mind that the camera is also viewing this on an angle right now. So some of these might look like they're a little bit off frequency, but I have to have the camera on this angle because the bubble dome window here is really hard to get the glare off with a light shining on it so that we can see the dial. A little dial lamp behind there, you can kind of see it glowing behind there, but it's not enough to light the dial up enough for the camera to really see it. So that's the reason for that. These plastic bubble dome windows are really tough to get on camera without a big bright spot somewhere. So when I was moving this around on the desk, it was just a little bit by a little bit until I got the perfect spot. So that's it for the short wave bands. And then we're back into the broadcast band right here, the upper portion of the broadcast band. So all in all, this radio receiver is working wonderfully. I'm very, very happy with the results of this FADA radio. It's nice and sensitive. Should be a lot of fun to listen to some late night DX with. So all in all, project successful. I hope you enjoyed the restoration of this FADA radio receiver. If you are enjoying my videos, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be more videos like this coming in the near future. We'll be taking a look at vacuum tube and solid state electronic devices alike. So lots of very interesting things coming. If you haven't subscribed, now would be a good time to do that as well. The official 2020 Mr. Carlson's Lab calendar has been released and it's photograph quality. If you're interested in checking that out, just below the video's description is a Show More tab written in capitals. If you click on that Show More tab, it'll expose the link. If you click on the link, it'll take you to the site and you can flip through the pages of the calendar and see what's in the calendar. Check out its quality as well. A lot of time was put into that calendar and it turned out very, very nice. If you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level and learning electronics in a very different and effective way and gaining access to many of my electronic designs and inventions, you're definitely going to want to check out my ongoing electronics course on Patreon. I'll put the link just below the video's description as well under that Show More tab, and I'll pin the link at the top of the comments section. So click on the link and it'll take you right there. All right, until next time, take care. Bye for now. And on to the next project.